Thank you. So um, I've got a complete change of uh, tack, which is vitamin D and obesity. And uh, in preparing this talk, we're encouraged to um, have some controversial uh, thoughts and perhaps to challenge some of the ideas. So uh, this is just a, a talk outline for you. I'm going to start by pointing out that vitamin D is not a vitamin. So the definition of a vitamin is a necessary substance which we cannot synthesise, and of course humans can synthesise vitamin D if we get sun exposure. So 7-dehydrocholesterol in the skin on UVB exposure is converted to vitamin D, and sadly the same uh, UV rays are the ones that cause uh, sunburn and increase our risk of skin cancer. So if you use sunburn protection cream, there is no avoiding the fact that you will also impair your vitamin D synthesis. And then vitamin D in the circulation in the, uh, gets to the liver, whereas it is hydroxylated on the 25 carbon atom up here. And 25 hydroxyvitamin D is not the active hormone, but it is the hormone we measure. It circulates in nanomolar concentrations and is relatively stable on a day-to-day -day basis in a given individual. We these days have quite reasonable assays, so we can actually measure it, which is good. 10 or 15 years ago, some of the assays were excellent random number generators. And um, then 25 hydroxy vitamin D requires another hydroxylation step, which is on the one carbon atom. And it was classically thought that that only happened in the kidney, but it's increasingly recognised that this also happens in many other cell types, especially placenta, macrophages, some other inflammatory uh, and immune cells, and from some of our work, probably also in a subset of skeletal muscle cells. So 125D, I'll call it from now on, versus 25D, is the active hormone, but it circulates only at picomolar concentrations, is subject to reasonably rapid fluctuations, and if you're not measuring it by MSMS, the measurement is not necessarily very accurate. And then if you've got a good system, why not stick to it? Vitamin D is then inactivated by yet another hydroxyl group being stuck this time on the 24 carbon, and this is called calcitroic acid. And part of the problem, I think, with this field is that all of these substances have a variety of names which all sound relatively similar, so completely inactive calcitroic acid sounds a little bit similar to calcitriol and various other things in this pathway. Vitamin D signals when it binds to the imaginatively named vitamin D receptor, which then dimerizes most often with the retinoid X receptor, but sometimes with another copy of itself, regulate, uh, recruits a transcriptional complex and regulates gene expression. Regulates hundreds of genes and mostly in an upward direction, but it does certainly suppress expression of some genes. And then on top of this, vitamin D also has a non-classic signaling pathway, which means not going through this nuclear pathway and regulating gene expression, but this is mediated by the same receptor, which is then alternately stuck in the cell membrane and causes rapid changes in intracellular messenger signaling and can cause changes with seconds to minutes rather than the transcriptional changes which take minutes to hours. So, if we move on to the idea of associations between obesity and vitamin D, many of you will already be well aware that obesity is associated with lower vitamin D. And I've included this study because it included a bit of a weight range, but also a group of different ethnicities. So it was just a nice study because it um, incorporated all um, attendees. And the associations are modest, but highly statistically significant. So the lower your vitamin D, the greater the weight and the body mass index in this paper. This uh, group looked at what they described as lean and obese subjects, but you'll notice that the definition of lean has snuck up a little bit into the overweight range in this group. And in American and uh, Australian European uni units, you can see that the lean people tend to have higher 25 vitamin D than the obese group. But in this study, the obese group are doing reasonably well. As you would expect, this corresponds to parathyroid hormone levels, which are lower in the lean group than in the obese group, so they're having to raise their parathyroid hormone levels, presumably to maintain serum calcium. And in this study, they've also measured 125D, which has a very similar proportional change. So uh, significantly lower vitamin D in obese subjects. 
And this study is nice because it actually shows the plot. You can see right out to the extremes of body mass index. The, the correlation is loose but convincing, and then much less tight for 125D, which again reflects that we don't usually use this as the biomarker for adequacy of status. Now, human trials in terms of obesity and effect on weight are disappointing because most of them either use completely inadequate doses, don't prove that they've achieved a change in serum vitamin D, or in the case of the ones I'm going to show here, um, are just so tiny that they're very underpowered. So this example uses, oops, only 54 people, um, uh, fairly young, uh, just into the obese range, and they weren't messing around. They gave 100,000 units of vitamin D at the start and then 4,000 units per day for 16 weeks, or matching high dose and then daily placebos. And indeed, they increased the 25D by 57 versus two. But there was absolutely no change in insulin sensitivity or insulin secretion. And in fact, the weight went up non-significantly in the vitamin D group. And the fat mass measured by DEXA didn't change significantly with only a 0.4% change. On the other hand, if you go looking in the literature, you can find a couple of also very small studies which do suggest significant benefit. In this case, they've taken people who have type 2 diabetes, and again, it's a small number, and then they've randomised them to a yoghurt drink so that necessarily contains some calcium, or the same yoghurt drink with further supplemental calcium and a respectable dose of vitamin D twice a day for 12 weeks. And they have a significant difference in waist circumference, but that's largely because the placebo group have an unexpected, rather large increase in their waist circumference in this study. But there is a significant decrease in fat mass with minus 1.9 kilos versus plus 0.6. And one thing that was kind of interesting, this study has gone back to the genetic uh, influences and looked at a particular SNP in a transcription factor. And if you have this AA SNP, then yet all of those, that group was, had all of the benefit, and the people who didn't have the AA SNP didn't have any benefit from this yogurt drink. And it turns out in this case that the alternate site actually eliminates the binding site for vitamin D receptor in its uh, promoter, so they at least have some biological plausibility. And then I, I don't think the field in terms of randomised controlled trials really gets further than that. But to go back to trying to be controversial, I would like to suggest to you that in fact obesity isn't caused by vitamin D deficiency but that obesity causes vitamin D deficiency. So this nice study here gave people the same dose of UV radiation. So they took the same amount of skin and they gave them the same number of joules of um, UV radiation. And hopefully you can see that while the obese people indeed did start a bit lower, the controls get almost double the increase in serum vitamin D with the same UV exposure. And in separate individuals, the same group have fed people uh, vitamin D2. And if you separate this by mass spec, you can separate um, whether you're looking at vitamin D2 or D3, and the predominant circulating form in people is D3. So if you give people a nice big dose of D2, you can then measure the increase. And hopefully you can also appreciate that the lean people here in the black have a much bigger increase than the obese people. So it's about a 30% difference out at one day after the dose. Fat may also store vitamin D, but the evidence for this is much more circumstantial in people. There's better evidence for this in animals. But I thought since the, D the diabetes prevention studies were coming up in this meeting, I would just mention this um, interesting association from the diabetes prevention program. So the placebo group, of course, didn't have a substantial change in weight at two years, and they didn't have a substantial change in their 25D levels. But the lifestyle group was very successful in terms of decreasing their weight and had about a seven kilo weight loss at that time point. And they had a small but significant increase in serum vitamin D, which would be consistent with fat releasing vitamin D as you lose the fat. But there's better data to support that this is actually biologically correct in animals, but it may also be true in humans. So obesity associates with decreased circulating 25D, and I think that's been very well demonstrated across large groups of epidemiologic studies, and human fat may 
store vitamin D. But it's very unclear whether low D associates with increased risk of developing obesity. And so we turn to an animal model, and I'll short circuit to the conclusion before I show you our data. I think that um, vitamin D deficiency actually may be useful for preventing obesity. So we turn to vitamin D receptor null mice. These mice have genetic deletion of the vitamin D receptor. They need to be fed a special diet, which is high in calcium, phosphate, and lactulose in order to push the calcium and phosphate into the animals or they die from hypocalcemia. So we fed both the knockout mice and their wild type litter mates the same diet. And hopefully you can see that their calcium and phosphate are pretty well preserved. Still a bit of a difference in magnesium. On um, the rescue diet, in our colony of these mice, they are not statistically significantly lighter, although you can see there's a bit of a trend both in female and male knockouts shown in white. But in many colonies around the world from these mice, um, which came from Marita May in Boston originally, the mice are sometimes lighter. But a trend in our colony, they are shorter, so if you give the mice an anaesthetic, and then measure their nose to base of tail length, they're a little bit shorter. So um, that's a feature related to the bone effects of vitamin D. But they do have decreased fat weights, even though they are not decreased in body weight. So there's only a trend for epigonadal fat, but a significant magnitude of decrease in subcutaneous fat pads. And if you assess the mice by DEXA, which you can do in a similar way to how you evaluate body fat in humans, then there's also a similar fold decrease in fat. So how do you get that? They have a substantial increase in energy expenditure. So if you put them in metabolic cages and you look at their oxygen consumption, it's higher both at night when mice are more active and during the day when mice rest. And if you look at their respiratory exchange ratio, then the changes um, in carbon dioxide production suggest that the vitamin D receptor null mice are less prone to burning carbohydrate. As your RER approaches one, you're burning entirely carbohydrate for fuel, and as it goes down, you're burning more fat for fuel. This appears to be related to brown fat in these mice. So brown fat, and a picture is shown up here, is a fat depot that is in between the shoulder blades in mice and in human neonates. And it was thought that human adults didn't have any until the field was reignited uh, about 10 years ago with a group of um, PET scan studies proving that humans do have brown fat. It's largely located in the neck. The cells are characterised by being positive for uncoupling protein 1, UCP1. They're multilocular, so there are lots of little lip lipid droplets as opposed to the classic white fat. They have very high mitochondrial content. And what UCP1 does is it uncouples the mitochondrial respiratory chain so that near the end of the process, instead of producing ATP from burning glucose or lipid, you produce heat. So there is also beige fat which is a more recently discovered kind of fat. In some papers, it's called bright or browned white fat. And again, it has some of these multilocular cells in between them, all classic large white adipocytes. Also has UCP, high mitochondrial content, and is capable of thermogenesis. So this just shows you what I'm talking about in terms of brown fat in people. This is a scan done at 27 degrees, and you can see that the brown fat is not on. But if you take the same person after you've exposed them to 19 degree temperatures for a few hours, you can see this avid um, fluorodeoxyglucose uptake in the supraclavicular region and down the paraspinal region, and this acts to produce heat. So uh, the vitamin D receptor null mice have increased browning of fat. They have increased UCP1 expression in subcutaneous fat. And hopefully you can appreciate that in the subcutaneous fat here by Western, there's a lot more UCP1 protein than in the wild type mice. And uh, this is a picture of the subcutaneous fat stained for UCP1. And hopefully you can appreciate that there's a fair bit of brown staining in these cells, which are smaller and multilocular compared to the controls. So does this matter? Well, if it applies in humans, 
then I think it does. Because over the 24 hours, we have an 11% higher energy expenditure in mice lacking the vitamin D receptor. And because of time, I haven't shown you the data today, but we can produce about an 8 or 9% increase if we make the mice vitamin D deficient as well. So you don't have to delete the receptor to achieve this effect. If you just calculate some back of the envelope numbers, total daily energy expenditure for a 40-year-old woman who weighs 70 kilos and does very little exercise is about 1,800 kilocalories. If you scale that up to an obese man who weighs 100 kilograms, that's 2,600 kilocalories a day. So the 11% increase winds up at about 190 to 280 kilocalories, and that adds up over the course of a year. Obviously, this would be the hypothetical situation where you don't eat more in order to compensate for your increased calorie expenditure. But it's perhaps even nicer if you're trying to talk to people about various things that they might do to improve their weight to suggest that they could eat a tiny bit more and still potentially lose weight. So we recommend that people don't put on as many blankets or heaters in winter and those sorts of things, um, quite literally. So obese and overweight people definitely have increased rates of vitamin D deficiency, but the same dose of UV exposure on the same area of skin or a same dose of vitamin D causes smaller increases, and fat appears to store vitamin D and levels increase with weight loss, so this may be a, rel a relevant store in people. But lack of vitamin D signaling increases energy expenditure via increased brown fat. I can't find any PET scan data in humans looking at people who are D deficient and then repeating the scan after treating them. So if any of you have uh, nice tame radiology departments, you might seriously consider that as a study. Um, so we activate this to prevent body temperature drops when it's cold. And so I think this makes some sort of teleologic sense, and here I'm just getting into wild speculation. But obviously in winter we have lower environmental temperatures, and so we would have more useful brown or beige fat function to prevent decreased body temperature, which obviously has the potential to be lethal. Vitamin D decreases with decreasing UV exposure, so as winter gets closer, your vitamin D level should go down. And I wonder if falling vitamin D leading to increased beige or brown fat is an evolutionary mechanism. And perhaps, I'm not advocating vitamin D deficiency as a therapy, uh, that would be a bit silly, but perhaps we should permit some annual variation in vitamin D where we target uh, pleasingly high levels across summer and then allow people to drop down to, say, 50 nanomoles per litre in winter. I don't think we want deficiency, but uh, I think that would be very interesting to study. Uh, I'd like to thank the organisers for the invitation and members of my group, past and present, and the NH and MRC is the Australian uh, research funding body, and I have no relevant conflicts. Thank you. Questions? <clears throat> yeah, I didn't understand the, the last thing you said, that increased brown fat should make us ready for the winter. But increased brown fat on the one hand will give us a lot of, of thermal energy, but on the other hand will cause weight loss. If so, it's activated. So it's, I mean, I yes. would think... Uh, so if it's activated, it will cause uh, weight loss. So hibernating animals, for example, all have a lot of brown and beige fat, and that's how they survive the winter. And so, yes, they're burning calories, but they don't die of hypothermia. Um, and fortunately, that isn't common these days in the human situation, uh, but it's a, a, an evolutionary decision to sacrifice your stored fat to keep you alive. Is there any study that shows that exposure to cold causes weight loss? Not in people. There are in animals. In people, yeah. um, there is a study in people done by Paul Lee at the NIH where they had people come and sleep in a room for four months 
and uh, it increases daily energy expenditure by about 200 kilocalories a day and slightly improved glucose and insulin in a group of young healthy people who had excellent glucose and insulin at baseline. Um, beyond that, I'm not aware uh, of human data yet. Sooner or later, someone is going to report the Mirabegron data. Um, all of the trials which have looked at it for the purposes of uh, bladder overactivity have failed to report follow-up weight. And I don't know if that's because the urologists didn't think to measure it or because it didn't change. Um, Kees Kostanje, I did a lot of the Mirabegron research, so I can, I, can, I can give you some data on that. It's not that people have not looked at it because um, Mirabegron has been tested as an anti-diabetic in the past. And uh, so there was a full, a full uh, uh, body of data, but nothing happened. And we know the answer in, uh, in, in the meantime, because um, the difference is that in brown fat is existing in humans, but it's not connected to beta-3 receptors. In uh, animals, um, brown fat is connected to beta-3 receptors, and there you also, you'll find all the heat effects, etc. Um, so we have to be a little bit careful in the translational science experiment in doing mouse data and trying to extrapolate them to humans. So because I think if I extrapolate your experimental data from mice into the, into the humans, I think you may have ignored that also white fat contains um, beta receptors, and that's beta-1 receptors mainly, that also have uh, a participation in energy conversion. And if you think that if heart rate goes up because of, uh, of uh, uh, the energy level being, being improving, it could be a beta-1 uh, effect that you measure there. The beta-1 drugs in people haven't been associated with significant degrees of weight loss or activation of brown fat. So yes. there are some quite nice studies uh, looking at that. You can activate brown fat in humans with some of the adrenergic agents, but you need to get into um, unpleasant cardiac side effect territory. Yes. That's very high doses that you need. So normally speaking, it would not be relevant in normal life. Mm. But uh, if we're talking about vitamin D, I guess there aren't known um, effects in terms of uh, heart rate and blood pressure. But of course, the animal models have increased long-term hypertension and cardiac fibrosis. So there are many reasons not to recommend vitamin D deficiency as a therapy, uh, but it's an interesting uh, association with obesity.